Two deans shot by a student at East High last year have taken the steps in filing a lawsuit against Denver Public Schools. Austin Lyle was required to be pat down for weapons. He fired a gun during one of those searches. A dean says school administrators failed to follow safety protocols. Here's 9 News reporter Kelly Renke. Two deans at Denver's East High School survived a shooting last March after a student fired a gun inside the school. Now they're calling the district negligent for what happened before Austin Lyle pulled the trigger. Documents obtained by Nine News show in September, Eric Sinclair and Gerald Mason filed a notice of claim, something they must do before filing a lawsuit. Last March, Sinclair was patting Lyle down for weapons before the student shot him and Mason. In his claim, Sinclair says the assistant principal and student safety coordinators failed to follow proper safety protocols. Before attending East, Lyle was expelled from Cherry Creek schools for issues with firearms. He was also on probation for a weapons charge. Even knowing that, a police report says Denver Public Schools at first only required Lyle to do a verbal check-in. Verbal only, no weapons check. It wasn't until a student reported seeing him with a gun in class that he was required to be patted down. Sinclair, in his claim, says after that report, East High's assistant principal and principal didn't take reasonable action to protect faculty. Mason also names the district and school board members in his claim. He said he suffered permanent injuries because of the district's recklessness. Eric Sinclair says his damages are more than $1 million. Mason listed his damages as more than $5 million. Denver Public Schools says they are not able to comment on possible lawsuits. This is a first step. Um, when we talk about Luis Garcia, his family made that first step months ago. Yeah, they uh, filed a notice of claim last May, and they still have not filed a lawsuit. So again, these two deans filed separately a notice of claim back in September, and at this point, uh, no lawsuit has been filed in that case either. Okay, it takes time. All right, thank you, Kelly. Former President Donald Trump will stay on primary ballots around the country, and that means right here in Colorado. This morning, the U.S. Supreme Court issued a unanimous decision saying that only Congress, not states, can disqualify a candidate using the Constitution's insurrection clause. Republican Norma Anderson was one of six Colorado voters that joined a liberal group out of Washington, D.C. to sue and keep Trump from running for office again, citing the 14th Amendment. She says she knew after the Supreme Court hearing earlier this month in D.C. that she would not win her challenge to keep Trump off the primary ballot though her legal team saw silver linings in the 9-0 decision against them. We did lose, but unlike the Broncos analogy, what happened here was that Donald Trump asked the court to do several things, They only any one of which would have resulted in a victory for him. They only did the narrowest, most procedural one. So I would analyze this more, not as a 55-10 defeat, but as a... a game that was decided by the refs. It's a blowout. Oh, you, yeah. Yeah. I don't see where we got, what did we get, according to the lawyers? Bottom line, Trump is eligible for the 2024 election, and any future challenge citing the Constitution's insurrection clause is on hold until Congress passes legislation that says if courts can consider those challenges or if it's only Congress that can. Colorado is one of more than a dozen states holding their primary presidential election on Super Tuesday. You need to return your ballot or vote in person by 7 tomorrow night. We have more information about how to find the closest location to where you are in our election article on 9news.com. So far, the state says it's received nearly 1 million ballots. Of course, we'll be following along all tomorrow as Super Tuesday results come in. You can follow our updates tomorrow night on air and online at 9news.com. USPS says two letter carriers were robbed at gunpoint today in the Montbello neighborhood of Denver about 5 p.m. A home security camera captured the suspects taking off in a white Hyundai Sonata. USPS says this first happened nearly, nearly near Bowling Drive and Duluth Court, the second on Eureka Court. If you have any information, you are asked to call U.S. Postal Service inspection at the number on your screen. A business owner in Commerce City is furious after four mass burglars smashed into his vape shop with a stolen car, stole $5,000 worth of items, and then left behind tens of thousands of dollars in damage. The burglary happened just after 3 o'clock Friday morning near East 62nd Avenue and Vasquez Boulevard. Nine News reporter Brianna Clark talked to the owner tonight. 
I end up seeing them walk back into their car and it looked like they were about to leave when then all of a sudden they threw it in reverse and hopped the curb. The shop has been broken into before, but never like this. I'm cursing these guys out. I'm really angry. I mean, this is this is my livelihood, you know? Alice Sawaget is the owner of Darth Vapor Smoke Shop in Commerce City. One of these, look how small it is. It's a, it's a tiny little thing. They come in either five or ten in a box. It's what he says these thieves took when they broke into his store early Friday morning, stealing $5,000 worth of product and causing 20000 in damage. We've noticed the last few years from uh, January to the end of March-ish, especially when it's starting to snow, when it, when it really starts to snow, we know it's going to happen. That's when they come and hit us. A trend he's seen again this year. My uncle in Highlands Ranch, he has a few shops. Uh, five times in three weeks, they all got hit. Allah's business partner owns a vape shop in Wheat Ridge. Police say three masked people broke into that store on February 7th. Don't be surprised if you get a text from me in the next two weeks saying I got hit again. He's already had three break-ins in 14 months. A fourth could be detrimental, and not just for him. It's scary because it's like, oh, can I afford to pay them, keep paying my employees and getting hit like this every other week? I can't. I'd almost rather leave the door unlocked that night and just walk in and take what you want, but don't ruin the whole storefront. Wheat Ridge and Commerce City Police have yet to make any arrests. Investigators are still trying to figure out if these crimes are related. And for the store to keep being hit over and over again, you would think these types of shops have what, like a lot of security at some level, right? Yeah, they do. He's implemented stronger windows. These are actually reinforced so that if someone were to throw something at it, they won't break. He wasn't prepared for a vehicle to be running into it. Yeah, I guess windows are no match for a car. All right, Brianna, thank you. Mm -hmm. There is still some lingering snow in the mountains tonight. Here's a look at I-70 near Vail Pass. Driving conditions aren't great. They're not horrendous either. And Lauren, the mountains are just digging all this snow. Not the wind, but the snow. Yeah, that's right. We well, take the snow. The wind you can keep, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we've been seeing those higher totals over the high country the last day or so. These totals do come from the National Weather Service, and these are the official totals. I know we've gotten a couple of uh, people questioning the numbers. These are our official totals from the National Weather Service. Green Mountain Reservoir reported 19 and a half inches of snow. Ridgeway saw 17, just under 17 inches in Cameron Pass. Winter Park reporting 16 inches, 14.3 in Glendevy and Spicer. Breckenridge reporting 14 inches, just over 13 in Silverthorne. Loveland Pass and Copper Mountain both reporting 13 inches of new snow. Mount, Cre Mount Crested Butte reporting a foot of new snow. So we are going to continue to keep these winter weather advisories in effect for the next couple of hours or so because while we're still seeing maybe smaller amounts of snow, it's the winds that are causing a big issue. So we'll talk more about that. We'll also talk about more of the lingering mountain snow over the next few days and when the Front Range can finally get some snow chances then moving ahead to the weekend the sunshine and warm weather returns i'll have all of these details for you just ahead of my seven day forecast thanks lauren people convicted of shoplifting in aurora would go straight to jail under a new ordinance making its way through city council the ordinance already passed its first reading it would require <coughs> jail time for anyone convicted of retail theft valued at a hundred dollars or more the first offense would be a mandatory minimum of three days in jail second offense 90 days a third, 180 days. A business owner who's dealing with shoplifting hopes it passes. Well, we want our customers to feel safe when they come in. And uh, having a law that gives consequences immediately helps us do that. So, and if it does this much, I'm great. If it does this much, I'm better. Alison Coombs, who's an Aurora City Council member, is against the idea. She says studies show it won't stop people from reoffending, especially if police aren't solving these crimes seems like we're going to be putting a lot of resources into something that is unlikely to be effective and no amount of sentencing is going to change that if people don't think they're going to get caught. This ordinance passed its first reading seven to three. It will have a second reading next week.